folks, uh, I've done uh, several stories on uh, the passing of Fidel Castro and how uh, various people looked at it, how the white Cubans looked at it, um, the black Cubans didn't look at it as, un, um, as in the same way that the uh, white Cubans who were forced to uh, leave the islands uh, looked at it and how black people look at it. Now, here's an example of why black people feel like America really isn't out there for them. Now, as most of you should know, uh, 1960, 61, America put an embargo uh, against uh, Cuba. And that stopped a lot of stuff from coming in. Now, since then, um, other nations have uh, decided to ignore the embargo, and the United States is not going to shoot down planes or uh, sink ships from other nations. So basically, you know, we're a one country embargo. Uh, we don't uh, or haven't really dealt with Cuba as far as uh, trade and other things are concerned. But that actually isn't necessarily true. Actually, it's not true. We have still dealt with Cuba when it comes to issues of uh, humanitarian uh, trade. That means that uh, we still were in the business of selling them food and uh, vital uh, commodities uh, that the people needed to survive. Now, that wasn't cars or phones or computers you know, that kind of stuff, they, you know, would have had to have gotten that type of stuff from other countries. And for whatever reason, um, the uh, major car manufacturers in this country, Chevy, Ford, and um, uh, uh, trying to think, uh, Chrysler, uh, didn't sell uh, any cars into Cuba. And for whatever reason, because of the alliances that uh, we have with uh, the other car making countries like uh, Germany, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, etc., uh, they weren't shipping cars and, and computers and commodities into Cuba either. Okay. But when it came to food, the United States has never really cut them off from. Uh, trade as far as food is concerned. Now, this particular story is uh, going to highlight just exactly how the United States government feels about uh, black people, especially black farmers, because black farmers had cut a deal with the approval of uh, the United States to ship them you know, like millions of dollars worth of food. Winning deal for our black farmers, obviously winning deal for them. Now, at the same time, um, Reagan fucked over a bunch of, uh, well, most of the black farmers in this country uh, by not granting them uh loans and other forms of grants, in other words, discriminated against black farmers while at the same time it was making available federal grants and loans to white farmers. So when the black farmers basically cut a deal with uh, Castro, okay, in order to ship them food, the United States turned around and for political reasons voided their contracts. Now, they didn't give them any reasons why they voided their contracts, they just voided them. So that was purely political. Meanwhile, you had other food companies in this country uh, like uh, Purdue, you know, Chicken and uh, Monsanto and various other uh, food uh, producing companies that uh, were still able to sell into Cuba. 
So, on the one hand, should we have been pissed off that the black farmers were discriminated against and in a lot of cases lost their farms for uh, reasons of uh, lack of being able to obtain uh, financing or the grants that the white farmers were able to obtain. And number two, uh, arbitrarily killing uh, profitable deals for our black farmers. Now here's a story of the uh, National Associations of Farmers and I uh, believe, well, you'll see the person's name. Um, I believe it's John Boyd, but I might be wrong on the John. Um, that uh, he basically uh, became associated with and ultimately is now the, the president of this association. And he's just going to give us a little history lesson on how America treated its black farmers. Now, I've been trying to run this group down, and I am very, very thankful for this particular show because I had some ideas uh, that would hopefully help uh, my community here in uh, Texas uh, and also work out really well for them as, as well. So um, after I get done, either at the end of today and more than likely tomorrow, um, I'm going to uh, start some work to see uh, what type of uh, contacts um, I can make in the local community uh, and uh, I've already made contact with the, the uh, National Farmers Association and gotten some inform contact information and spoken with people on the phone. So I'm going to see if my idea will work. And basically, just so that you know, the idea I have, and it's not my original idea. I had seen uh, this occur uh, up in California. But uh, there are farmers markets basically all over the country. And I noticed that down here where I am in Texas, there really aren't any. So uh, it was my thinking that I could get together with some uh, large uh, groups uh, that have a built-in clientele and see if a, a large farmers market uh, could be started um, based on uh, the availability of uh, products. And I was told that the majority of the products that uh, these farmers produce are organic. So they're more healthy for our people and we obviously do need a good supply of fruits and vegetables in order to, for us to uh, maintain a balanced diet. But anyway, I digress. Here's the story regarding uh, the history that uh, the black farmers have with uh, the country since basically the uh, 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. We've been talking about the death of Fidel Castro. Of course, he died Friday at the age of 90. And we've done different interviews. And so you have different reactions to his death. You've got uh, white Cubans who are, frankly, celebrating the death of Castro, talked about uh, his reign there, of course, uh, uh, running Batista out of the country. But you also have a different reaction from some African countries, but also African Americans, but specifically black farmers. 2013, uh, Castro agreed to a deal to purchase up to $25 million worth of agricultural goods produced by African-American farmers. The deal was negotiated at the same time black farmers were suing the U.S. government for racial discrimination involving farm loans. Joining us now is John Boyd, founder and president of the National Black Farmers Association. Uh, so, John, again, this is one of the, I saw the Black Enterprise story uh, about this as well. This is yes. one of those, one of the, again, one of those stories that, when I talked the other day about Castro and his legacy being complex, right? Uh, and I saw this debate on MSNBC with Soledad O'Brien and his one Cuban American who was just blasting, no, 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 this guy was a killer, he was a dictator. And I said, okay, you can be that and this at the same time. Gotcha. Oh, by the way, that Cuban American was a guy that I liked, and I still like him, but he, you know, he kind of ticked me off on this way. This one, that was Jose Diaz Ballard, who's uh, now uh, primarily on MB NBC. He was on MSNBC and had a morning show, but then he got promoted directly into NBC. And uh, he also is one of the main guys at, uh, I think it's uh, Telemundo. If it's not Telemundo, it's that other major uh, Spanish channel. So 
Uh, how did this relationship start between Castro and black farmers? Well, it, it started back in 1998 when we first had a, a meeting with uh, Fidel Castro. And he talked about his need for... Uh, so he had a meeting, so you and others were invited to Cuba? Or well, where did the meeting take place? It took place in Havana, Cuba. All of them did. We had five meetings uh, up until 2005 was our last meeting. The actual contract was secured in 2003 for uh, six million dollars, six plus uh, million dollars per quarter, about four quarters in a year, about $25 million. And uh, to me, for, Fidel Castro had a uh, presence uh, larger than his room itself. And uh, the last meeting when we signed the actual uh, contract to supply food to Cuba, uh, the agreement was signed in his house. And we went to his house and uh, military on both sides of the walls and he was standing there by himself in full army fatigues. Uh, military rifle and two pistols and I reached my hand out to him and he said John Boyd my friend nice to see you and I said my friend nice to see you the story was not about the actual contract the story was about me calling him his friend I mean what do people want me to say I'm in his house he has army fatigues and, and, and two pistols <laughs> I'm gonna be his enemy mm -hmm. but long story short is this was a very very historic contract because it was the largest contract with a U.S. organization or, 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 or company at one time for $25 million. We delivered four, four shipments to Havana, Cuba, totaling about $6 million before the Bush administration terminated our agreement, saying, hey, your shipping license has been revoked and we're now reviewing the agreement between black farmers and, and uh, the Cuban government. And uh, my last trip back to Havana, I was stopped in customs and held for two days and customs, uh, I was not allowed to come back into my country until I answered all of these questions about uh, the talks between the, the black farmers and the Cuban government. When, when, you, when, when you hear people talk about um, Castro and talk yes. about his legacy, mm -hmm. um, how important is this, this relationship that he had with African Americans to this overall legacy? It's totally, totally important because people need to take a second look at Castro. I'm not saying I support all of his uh, government policies and all of those things, but we need to take a second look because uh, when we were in the meeting, he said, well, we're bored. We share the same blood, and there's no reason why the United States government should not be contracting with uh, black farmers. He said, this contract is a drop in the bucket according to what you guys should be doing business with in your own country, and he's absolutely right. We have USAID that uh, don't buy any food from African-American farmers, so there's a lot that we can be doing in our own country. And it was after Castro made that statement in the public that the Bush administration revoked our shipping license to continue to ship goods to the Cuban government. Man, I mean, we know, we know that it's, we live in a country 330 million people and get a bubble when it comes to Castro. Right. The rest of the world looks almost the exact opposite in terms of this. And what you're saying, uh, Brother Boyd, is so important because right. you were legally able to do this. Yes. This was a political decision the Bush administration made. Right. What was you sending a message? We went through all of the necessary requirements for the Treasury Department to uh, uh, travel there and, 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 and come up with these contracts. We were not the only company that was shipping goods to Cuba. There was uh, Purdue, Tyson's, uh, ConAgra, ADM that was already conducting business with the Cuban government. And, so, then, uh, well, well, so why them and not you? I mean, that's exactly right. <laughs> you know, black farmers. <laughs> we know the answer. Right? right, we know the answer. And uh, lastly, uh, Fidel Castro also introduced us to other third world countries. Uh, Venezuela, uh, he, introduced, he introduced me to Chavez. Uh, Here's the other shit. All of these other uh, uh, Arafat. And all of these countries need this absolute same thing. They need equipment and food. So there's a lot of opportunities if we can work together. You've got to look at this legacy in its totality. Uh, you think about Nelson Mandela uh, being freed and uh, Castro uh, playing a significant role and being a, a big voice there. Again, you got to look at the whole record. Isn't free trade great? I mean, this is this is what we should this is what we should right. be doing. I mean, we should be applying this concept beyond just your situation, which yes. is a is a great one, where you you had a good that somebody else wanted, and you were able to negotiate a that deal um, free from government intervention, and that's what we should be doing. So whether that's Putin, whether that's Malaysia, whether that's you know Saudi Arabia, right. I mean, let's let's let the people trade goods for the yes. benefit of the whole until they intervened of course and lastly uh state intervened <laughs> right this president who, who went down and opened doors you know with the cuban government i know that 
uh, president-elect is not in support of that, and they're looking to roll back uh, the clocks there. You think he's going to go through with that? I mean, I hope and, and, leave, and leave the region open to people like China, who already made overtures. That's I mean, right. that, that would be so backward. Look, it, would, it would be horrible for this country. And, you know, for this president, President Barack Obama, and I think uh, this country is going to miss this president. Uh, African Americans are going to miss this president. And <laughs> have to do more to uh, lift up his legacy for him going to Cuba was such a huge step uh, it was underpaid in the media to me Roland uh, it should have been more highlighted uh, his trip to Cuba and and the actual outcome opening up doors and visitation all of these things have been stagnant for 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 decades all right then John Ball we appreciate it man thank thanks you. a lot thank you all right so now let me ask you a question uh, how would you feel if you were a black farmer and got the carpet pulled out from under you strictly for political reasons after you had jumped through all the hoops necessary got all the license and shipping uh, 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 agreements necessary in order to ship to Cuba and then uh, they turn around and say they're pulling your license and they're reviewing everything see that's you know that's the uh, hypocritical bullshit uh, that uh, you know legitimate black people who have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps have to go through okay we got to jump through a whole hell of a lot more hoops just to get to the same place as uh, other people, specifically white people, have to go through. Now, final point. China. The United States obviously has its allies uh, on the uh, Korean Peninsula. We have the South Koreans, uh, the Chinese have the North Koreans. Uh, we're a... Uh, the South Koreans obviously are a stone's throw from uh, China. The Chinese are making overtures to Cuba. Obama has opened up dialogue and diplomatic relations between the United States and Cuba. We have a historic opportunity to completely normalize relations. China is a communist country, though, you know, they become more capitalistic, okay? Um, Cuba is, quote-unquote, a communist country, but they are more than uh, happy to open up the country to uh, more capitalistic pursuits. If we don't get our shit straight with Cuba, and I mean pretty damn soon, and the Chinese come in there offering them aid and everything else, we are going to have a situation where we have, quote unquote, an unfriendly country, okay, right at our doorsteps, 90 miles away from the U.S. mainland. We better be proactive and thinking about this one because a misstep here and a slight of uh, the uh, Cuban. Uh, government, which yeah, I fully admit, uh, are they the most uh, people or human rights friendly uh, government in the world? No, but they're, you know, have the same situations as China and Russia and a bunch of uh, uh, other countries. So we need to stop being holier than now, let the Cuban people decide what they want to do. But as far as trade and everything else is concerned, we need to open up the doors and let the natural uh, progression of trade, uh, tourism, etc., roll in there. And who knows? We might have a pretty valuable ally uh, in the Caribbean. And Cuba has a tremendous amount of influence uh, in uh, South America as well. And we need to cultivate that influence.